would like to move us into the urban development, mobility and green building panel, panel three. The continuing rapid growth and urbanization of the U.S.-Mexico border region makes mobility and urban planning critical components of environmental protection, social inclusion, both within cities and in connecting across the border. The impact of green buildings, sustainable industrial parks, and transportation technology must be taken into account to ensure a greener and orderly transition. Next, I'd like to introduce the moderator of the panel, Carrie Bergman. Carrie is the Associate Director of Financial Structuring here at the North American Development Bank. Uh, she leads the bank's efforts in financing of green buildings and sustainable industrial parks, as well as municipal bond purchases in the United States. Prior to joining NADBank, prior to joining NADBank in 2018, she worked at IDB Invest, the private sector arm of the Inner American Development Bank, where she managed a portfolio of infrastructure loans for projects located throughout Mexico, Central America, South America, and the Caribbean. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a round, warm round of applause for Carrie and the panelists. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. Jesse, thank you for the introduction. I'm excited for the opportunity to moderate this panel on urban development with a focus on green buildings and mobility. We have some ex excellent panelists here today to address these issues. I'll start with an introduction to our panelists. We'll lead into their presentations and hopefully we'll have some time at the end for Q&A. But first, a joke. What would you call a power failure? A current event. Ah, uh, current event. Our first panelist is Charlie Hart. He is the Southern Border Executive with the U.S. General Services Administration, where he's worked for over 15 years. Through its public building service, the GSA is responsible for the construction and or leasing of workspace for 1.1 million federal workers and employees. So you can think of the GSA as the landlord for the U.S. federal civil workforce. Perhaps unknown to many, GSA is a leader in green building design, construction, and retrofits, and has strict standards for environmental, strict environmental standards for its buildings. As Southern Border Executive, Charlie is responsible for the portion of the U.S.-Mexico border all through Texas and New Mexico. As one can imagine, this means working closely with federal authorities, such as Customs and Border Protection, and the U.S. Department of Transportation to find workspace for the federal workers who are responsible for overseeing the entry into the U.S. and exit from the U.S. of people and goods between the U.S. and Mexico borders. No doubt, his work touches on issues of trade, transportation, security, and immigration, and it's very important for the land ports of entry or border crossings between the two nations. Charlie is also responsible for carrying out the Federal Sustainability Plan, which he'll tell us about in his presentation. Prior to his work at GSA, Charlie served for 30 years all over the world as an Army Ranger, paratrooper, and combat engineer. He was appointed Honorary Admiral in the Texas Navy when he retired from the Army as a Colonel. That appointment was made by the Governor of Texas. Charlie holds multiple accreditations, including a degree with distinction from the U.S. Military Academy West Point, a Master's in Civil Engineering from Stanford, an MBA from Golden Gate University, and a Master of Strategic Studies from the Army War College. Charlie lives in Ar Arlington, Texas with his family, and his hobbies include running, reading, and ballroom dancing. We're honored you can join us today, Charlie. Thank you for being here. Our next presenter, Carlos Orozco, joins us today from Monterey, Mexico, where he's the Urban Mobility Manager at the World Resources Institute in Mexico. For those of us unfamiliar with the WRI, it's a global research nonprofit established in 1982, headquartered in Washington, D.C., with offices all over the world, including in Mexico, Brazil, India, and China. The important work that the WRI does includes promoting environmental sustainability, economic opportunity, and human health and well-being. So as you can see, their values align very closely with the values of NADBank. As urban mobility manager, Carlos works on public transportation system projects as leader, technical advisor, and stakeholder coordinator in the planning, implementation, and operations of these projects. 
He's also responsible for leading the urban mobility plan and related innovative projects. Prior to his recent move to the WRI, Carlos worked for 12 years in the government of the state of Nuevo Leon as Undersecretary of Territorial Planning and also in the Mobility Directorate, among other roles, including with the metro area of Monterey. Carlos has served as an independent consultant and is also a graduate from the Tecnológico de Monterrey with a degree in civil engineering. He has a master's degree in urban planning and science, specializing in transportation from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. He continues to be active in, in his alma mater, Tecnológico de Monterrey, where he has given classes in transportation and mobility for over 10 years and is also a civil engineer career advisor. Thank you for joining us today, Carlos. Our third panelist up here on stage is Laura Morrison. She is the executive director for the Education Fund of the Texas Electric Transportation Resource Alliance. That is a mouthful. TechCetra is the acronym for this Electric Transportation Resource Alliance. As the TechCetra Fund's education TechCetra Education Fund's executive director, which was established in 2020 as a 501c3 nonprofit, the aim of the Education Fund is to act as the public education arm of the Alliance with the goal to promote adoption and use of electric transportation in Texas by 2035, a lofty goal, no less. Laura's had an interesting and illustrious career prior to her work at TechCetra. She was a two-term city councilwoman for the city of Austin, where she tackled issues including community development, public health, digital inclusion, sustainable water, and energy policies. She has also worked in the private sector as an engineer at Lockheed Market, Martin at Lockheed Martin. She studied math in her undergraduate studies at the University of California in San Diego, received a master's in mathematics from UC Berkeley, and subsequently a graduate certificate in disaster management from the University of North Carolina School of Public Health. As executive director at TechCetra Education Fund, Laura leads the fund in developing policies and programs to bring communities and resources together with the goal to reduce transportation emissions and address a variety of concerns, including climate change, health, environmental justice, and the economy. We're delighted to have her on our panel today. Our fourth panelist is unfortunately unable to be here in person due to illness. She was, however, kind enough to pre-record her comments and will kick off the panel today with her presentation. Lourdes Salinas lives in Monterrey, Mexico. She's been involved in the green building industry for over 15 years, working on projects across the globe. She's the founder and director of Three Environmental Consulting. Her firm, Three, specializes in technical, technology-based environmental consulting to help their clients achieve their sustainability design goals. In other words, she helps her clients, including in, in their projects, to achieve these goals and, and her project can range from commercial developments to residential properties, including affordable housing, schools, cities, municipalities, hospitals, sustainable industrial parks, and more. Three has worked on over 140 projects in various countries with a heavy emphasis on Mexico, including over 45 LEED certified projects. And when I use the acronym LEED, L-E-E-D, of course, I'm referring to the framework established by the U.S. Green Building Council back in 1994 to encourage and promote sustainable building and design. And it stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. Lou, as of 2019, has been a distinguished LEED Fellow and is also the recipient of various professional awards for her scholarship, leadership, and entrepreneurship. With that, we'll turn our attention to Lou's presentation. I think you will find that her comments will set the stage for an interesting and insi insightful discussion with our panelists. Thank you. So I'm really excited to be part of this panel. I'm really sorry that I cannot be present with you. Um, but basically, we wanted to start by giving you a little bit of perspective of, of what's going on um, nowadays in, in, in the market of the, of the building and construction sector. And the first initiative that I want to discuss with you is why are we here? Why are we talking and discussing these topics? And the, the thing is that we are breaking all records. It's been amazing, but um, since the Industrial Revolution, the average temperature of the Earth has been increasing on a steady step. Um, and to the latest years, it's been growing and growing in a very um, drastic and, and scary way. 
Um, so we've seen since the year 2000 that the 10 hottest days have occurred in the last 10 years. Um, and that has been something that has been kept uh, um, through, through it all. So we're worried about this happening. And I don't know if you've seen this, this analysis coming from um, Show Your Stripes studying fall, which is something created by the economists, um, where they basically analyze scientifically what what is needed to actually maintain the characteristics of our world so far. And they've measured that every half degree centigrade that we increase the average temperature of the world, it would actually create um, a radical change on the way that we live and work because um, the temperature would increase. And obviously that comes with other types of um, natural disasters and events that we, we don't want them. So scientifically, it's been demonstrated that in order to maintain the way of life that we have so far, we need to reduce our carbon emissions by 2030 on a half percent. That means that we should stop producing at least half of what we're producing now on a world basis and for 2050 to go to net zero to stop producing emissions. And this is because the emissions, once they get to the atmosphere, they stay there for a long while. So the impacts of what we've done in the past and in the present will be kept long for um, our future. So we need to, to focus on that. Um, and, and this is something that has been creating a lot of impact in the market, specifically on the building and, and construction sector. Um, and I wanted to share with you a little bit of the sustainability timeline, because this is not something new that we just started talking about. This is something that started since 19, 1960s with Rachel Carson in her book, Silent Spring, um, and that you've probably heard about the Earth Summit in 1992, the, Pro the Montreal Protocol, probably about the Kyoto Protocol, and all these um, activities that have been going on worldwide to try to protect our planet and protect our, our, our um, environment. And basically, I would say that nothing has actually made so much impact as what happened with the Paris Agreement and the Agenda 2030 that was developed through the 17 SDGs that the UN um, came up for and that many companies and, and governments worldwide are focusing into trying to achieve this Agenda 2030 to reduce, as I said previously, at least half, per, half of our carbon emissions till 2030. Um, on 2021, we had a COP, the COP26, which was called emergency, and basically um, this is creating a, a, a rampant um, interest from the markets, but especially from the banks. And I think that this is something very good because um, investors and banks have identified that climate risk is actually an investment risk. And this directly affects, I think, in a positive way, our building infrastructure and 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 projects uh, building projects because um once the banks and the people that finance these type of projects understand that climate risk is the risk for everyone um they've started identifying some brackets and some um uh, strategies that need to be complied by projects to actually showcase how they are planning to achieve their their CO2 and greenhouse gas emissions um, to at least half or even net zero. So the, the thing that I wanted to share with you is that the objective has not changed. Um, this, this 2030 target has been mentioned by many um, since the beginning of the 2000s. Um, and in 2018, there was this critical message coming from the UN mentioning that if we don't reduce our carbon emissions 50% by 2030, then we should think that in the future it was um, um, not mandatory, but something that we could not avoid um, that that uh, there was going to be a, a human extinction in the future. They didn't say it when or how, but they said that it was just not, there was no way back. So this is actually very um, tragic and important. And, and the target has not moved. Um, and every year that passes by, we have le uh, less amount of years to actually do something to create this, this, this positive change. So we currently, 2022, had eight years left to actually make this big transformation worldwide. And as companies, as developers, as, as people involved in this sector, um, we have a very big responsibility to actually create this change. 
especially because the building sector is very relevant in the opportunity to save emissions. So this graphic comes from IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel from Climate Change. And as you can see, what they're saying on the Y axis of the graph is the gigaton of CO2 equivalent per year that you can reduce. And what they're looking at the X axis is dollars. So that's 20, 50 or 100 USD. And basically what it's saying is that if you invest $20 um, in, in, in investment to make the energy supply system more efficient, that those $20 have the opportunity to reduce about two gigatons of CO2 equivalent on a yearly basis. But if you invest those same $20 on the building sector, then you have the opportunity to reduce um, your global, your, your, total CO2 emissions to up to 5.5 gigatons of CO2 equivalent per year. So this means that the building sector has a large opportunity, but also a large responsibility to actually invest on in these strategies that can actually impact carbon on a very drastic and positive way. There is a big urgency that we have um, and there is, there is a big impact we can make. So the urgency that I'm telling you about is actually growing every year. And there is a couple of concepts that are affecting this. So this is a comparison from 2010 and 2020. If we look at global energy related carbon emissions for building operations, they're actually increasing. They increase from 19% to 28%. And this is due especially to the fact that we're building more area of buildings, but also the, the projects that we're building are more carbon intensive as we use more um, in industrial services and as we use more um, systems, we're consuming more energy, but also as the climate increases its temperature, we're also needing more HVAC systems and more um, assisted systems to provide comfort in these spaces, which is creating an increase of carbon emissions, which is very um, dangerous and, and something that we need to work on as soon as possible. Then we have the global energy consumption of buildings. This has also been increasing, not as high as the, as the carbon emissions of the operations. So this means that the material um, um, sector has, has impacted in a positive way, reducing the, the impacts, especially I would say on the concrete and steel um, um, industries that have widely reduced their, their energy consumption to produce these construction materials in the last couple of years. The global floor area has increased at 20, 23%, which is a lot. The energy intensity from space heating, lighting, and space cooling has actually decreased, which is something good, um, but not to the enough rate that, could act, that it could actually impact the global energy-related carbon emissions from the operations of the buildings. Renewable energy in buildings has increased, but it's still quite small. And the solid waste streams contributed to building construction and demolition has also increased, which actually makes no sense because if we think that if we reduce the solid waste streams of our construction, um, that, that means that we're actually being more efficient in the way we construct. Um, so that's that's something to look to look into as well. And the challenge is actually to satisfy the growing needs with less carbon and resources. That's what we need to do. So if we understand that 40% of the greenhouse gas emissions come from the building sector, and that maybe, um, and, and that also about twice of the prime materials will increase by 2060, and the demand of energy will increase at least at 12%, and that the, the passenger transportation from 2015 to 2050 will triplicate, then we, we understand that we definitely need to work and put our efforts on these um, sectors, especially the building sector, construction sector, and also mobility. So green buildings and communities can actually create a lot of positive impact. Um, they, they, it's been measured they can reduce energy use up to 50%, carbon emissions up to 62%, water use about 40%, and many of the projects that we work on, this number even goes further. Um, and waste to landfill about 70%, and that's mainly on education. Um, so these these are projects that are actually cost effective, and that uh, this this achieving these targets, um, it's been measured and it's been demonstrated both in the U.S. and in Mexico that it's feasible and that it's good for the projects. 
although we need to find a way to make this movement go faster. So looking towards net zero, it's probably something very relevant for this industry. Um, most of the projects that we work on, on, the, on when, when they're new projects, um, they're always pursuing something different to actually challenge the market and showcase um, what what they what what the, the achievements of what they're doing and their objectives and a lot of them are looking into net zero as a potential solution because it's very easy to explain to the market what zero means it's probably more complex to explain what a platinum or gold or silver lead certification is but it's probably very easy to explain what zero waste zero water zero energy accounts for so this is what we should be focusing on and this, the, I wanted to show you this slide because this is very relevant. Um, normally, when we ask our clients how much they think that a sustainable project will, will cost, they typically go all the way to say, well, probably somewhere in between 20 or 30 percent. Um, I don't know how much, but it's definitely going to cost more. And the actual data showcases that it's actually less. Um, it can be less than the than the initial budget in the project because passive system solutions might reduce the energy consumption and it can go all the way to 12.5 percent but sometimes just the architect choosing a type of flooring could increase even more the cost of a project so sustainability it's not something that makes a project co um, costly and actually in latin america um, it's been it, it it's quite interesting because the result is even lower and I, I tr I've been trying to understand why in in the US and the rest of the world um, the the investment goes um, so has a higher percentage. And what I've noted is that um, most of the projects in in the US or or the rest of the world that want to showcase sustainability, they want to go all the way to either net zero or um, or a platinum certification or find that find a way to showcase sustainability everywhere they go. And what happens in Latin America is that the clients tend to focus on those strategies that are going to make their project more cost effective. So they take care about everything they invest in the project because they need to save the, the pennies, right, um, um, to, to make the project feasible. So on the green buildings, what has been showcased by this study run by the by the Colombian um, Green Building Council is that the average investment increase on green buildings in Latin America is 1.42%. And 69% of the projects that were analyzed in this study um, confirmed that their investment increased less than 1%. And 42% of the projects indicated a return on investment that was smaller than one year. So the business case for green building in Latin America actually is very feasible, economically feasible. And I wanted to show you just very briefly how I think that we can achieve this. So we've noticed that in many projects, what happens is that on the design stage, the project costs are quite small. And as the project moves towards construction, the, projects in, the project cost increases. But the opportunity to create savings um, in the design stage is a lot higher. Once the project starts the construction stage, these saving opportunities typically go down. So we want to focus on on doing holistic modeling for the primary stages of each project, where in the schematic design, um, the, the project can analyze the site, the volumetry, the massing to try to understand how to to develop the conceptual design of the project to exceed the benefits of the site and its climate. So analyzing the local water is the most important thing to do and then understanding how architecturally that can impact positively to reduce energy consumption of the building then during detail design um, typically what what we suggest is for projects to do something we call holistic modeling that is analyzing the envelope the passive systems design running ventilation analysis material analysis daylight radiation shading apertures and run a couple of times different iterations so that you can analyze cost and performance based um, results and that that can provide some value engineering because um, when you do the value engineering of the sustainability strategies in the design stage, you will always find um, strategies where that makes the project more, more feasible 
um, economically, but also to impact sustain in, in a more sustainable way. Um, so once you get to construction documents, doing thermal loads and initial energy models, and use those energy models to actually detail the value engineering and analyze those data so that you can um, document how that value engineering increases the benefits within the project, the comfort, the, the health and well-being of the users, the energy redu reduction, the carbon reductions, water reductions, etc. And then include all of that on a final report so that, that when the project goes to bidding and construction stage, those strategies won't be ripped off by trying to reduce costs that most likely will create additional costs later in the process. So a simple example about this is when you do an envelope uh, analysis with, where you use clear glass, for example, and a base um, wall, and you probably need about 74 tons of air conditioning. And maybe if you use a uh, efficient low e glazing system and um, are a higher R value on your walls and roofs, you might need 22 um, tons. But the idea here is to find the most cost-effective solution that can give you the best benefits, which probably is with a middle type of glazing system and a middle amount of um, insulation that can potentially give you 25. I know this is 25 tons. I know this is not focusing necessarily on net zero, but it's a first step for projects that want to find sustainability through a cost effective way. Um, and what happens or the pattern that we've seen in the past is that clients agree that sustainability is cost effective and then they try to do all their projects sustainable and then they finally get to the to the Eureka moment when they decide to move towards something more um, intensive, such as net zero or resiliency. Um, there's also some certifications that are out there around the world that can be used to guide these processes. Um, so basically, there's there's a lot of them. Um, they're, they're all recommended. Some of them are for certain types of projects, some of them for other types of projects, but basically it's it's good to follow a methodology that has been proved and that has been and, and that has some international recognition to actually pursue um, the, the best benefit and outcome for all of your projects. So with this, I finalize my presentation and I appreciate very much the opportunity to be here with you, even if it's um, through through the internet. Thank you so much. So with those introductory remark remarks from Lourdes, I'll ask Charlie Hart to join me here at the podium, piggybacking a little bit on both the opportunities and responsibilities of the building sector in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. All right, thank, thank you, Carrie. And so for my opening slide, I, I wanted to put a picture of the Bridge of the Americas uh, land port of entry in El Paso, Texas, because uh, we just received funding to modernize and expand that facility. We want to do it in a very green way, capitalizing on the best practices and lessons that we learned over the last couple of years in green buildings. And I'll I'll talk about that as we as we go forward. Okay, so here's next slide, please. So here's what I'm going to talk about today. All right, very briefly. I only have 10 minutes, and I could probably ramble on forever. Um, so I've put links in the presentation deck that if, if you want a deeper dive, you'll have an opportunity to do that. Um, but just want to give you a high level overview of, of what's in my heart and what's in my head concerning green buildings and mobility. So I'll talk about the federal sustainability plan. I'll talk about high performance green buildings, um, environmental justice, which is a particularly important new concept uh, that we're trying to roll out as as we try to be more sustainable going forward. And then there is a sustainable facilities tool that if you have not seen it before, I think everyone should um, get the tool and put it in the hands of their children and as an educational measure to for the world to get greener. All right, next slide, please. So the December 2021 uh, federal sustainability plan, it set the stage for the federal government to use the scale and procurement power to meet very ambitious goals of the administration to address climate change, resilience, and the sustainability needs of the communities, while at the same time addressing environmental justice and equity. There are very ambitious goals in the sustainability plan, and I've got a link, you know, you can track the government's progress on it through the sustainability.gov website. 
Um, but it's just a plan. It's, it's a, a mandate for all the federal agencies to get on board and, and start getting serious about sustainability. But then we were, as an agency, all right, ne next slide, it's just a start, but the, it really relies on the innovation of the agencies to put that into practice. So I want to talk, next, sli next slide, oh no, this slide, this is good, go back, sorry. Um, the GSA Public Building Service, as Lord has said, the greatest potential uh, for reducing greenhouse gases comes in the building industry, and we're the public building service. Um, so we realize, you know, we have a chance to do a lot of good. Um, so our goals are, you know, we will reduce the environmental footprint. We're going to you know, accelerate adoption of carbon-free electricity. We're going to reduce water waste and energy consumption, um, and, and then adopt smart technologies. We think the combination of these things are going to lead to a more sustainable future in greener buildings. So um, the Public Building Service always has been an industry leader in the reduction of water, waste, and energy, um, but it's just a start. Um, we, we have a, a lot more to, to go in the future. We've adapted standards because they say if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. Lourdes mentioned the certification programs. We've embraced Green Globes and LEED and sustainable sites and other programs uh, to try to get very serious about approaching our goals and measuring and rewarding um, people who are pursuing those goals. So the next slide, we're actually adopting very sustainable. Here's just a, a, a sampling of this technology that we have recently recommended for broader deployment in the federal facilities including the varial speed magnetic levitation and direct drive screw chillers uh, for the for you um, heating ventilating and ventilation and air conditioning buffs uh, we have some alternative water treatment technologies for cooling towers um, we've tested and evaluated and accepted low e window retrofits and uh led lighting upgrades so over the past five years gsa has deployed these and other advanced technologies in over 200 GSA-owned federal buildings, uh, resulting in annual savings of over $7 million. And that's just the start. We have the GSA Proving Ground, where, um, where we test promising technologies, actually put it into our facilities and evaluate it. And at the end of that period, if it's something that is uh, showing uh, particular potential for greener buildings, we'll adapt that as a federal standard. And we've done that on some of the technology that I mentioned, and there's more to follow. Okay, next slide. Also, we recently updated our facility standards. Um, if you're familiar with it, there's a book called the P100. I've got a link, a link to the P100 um, in the presentation, so you can down, download a copy of it. Um, but the new facility standards actually require us to partner with the local communities and with historic preservation groups, local governments and tribes and metropolitan planning organizations to take a holistic approach to the development of greener buildings. So some of the prominent examples include the community outreach events that we did with the city of Brownsville recently and with El Paso. And we invited participation in the development of our projects in support of the bipartisan infrastructure law. Um, I showed you the Bridge of the Americas project and we expect to have full participation of all the various groups within the community and, and develop it going forward to try to really add value and incorporate the principles of environmental justice along the way. So the next slide, a little bit, I wanna change topics. I wanna talk specifically about green buildings. Um, on the slide here, this is a picture of the Oklahoma City Federal Building, um, which was constructed in in between 2001 and 2003 and at that time um, it was just in the early days of the green building movement and we wanted this to be the very greenest building possible let's let's build a very green building and see what happens and we did that and unfortunately the resultant product um, even though it's a beautiful building it was functional and everything else but the energy consumption of that building was disproportionately high. In fact, the energy usage um, and the energy cost of this building was the greatest in our entire inventory. So here it was, and you know, we had all kinds of green technologies that we adapted, um, but it turned out we didn't know what we were doing. 
but we're a learning organization. You know, we use this as a learning point and then fast forward. All right. To, to the next slide. In 2019, we opened, we learned from our experiences over time. You know, we've been hiring staff, we've been getting smarter, we've been training ourselves, we've been looking at the industry and see what's being built. So in 2019, we opened the Columbus, New Mexico land port of entry. It achieved a LEED Platinum certification. It's a net zero energy building and achieved a sites, site certification, the American Institute of Architects awarded the facility with one of its top 10 awards in 2020. Um, so a number we did a number of things there and and a lot of it was a testament uh, to the evolution of our workforce, the knowledge um, of what it takes to be a green building. And this was a difficult I, this. I remember the early days of designing this building and we were constantly balancing ugly versus sustainable. I mean, it was. It seemed like the more the more sustainable the building was, the uglier it was, and the architects didn't want to buy into it. And we finally found, and that's important. You know, you want a building that you can be proud of because, you know, this is land ports of entry are the modern day Statue of Liberty. We wanted this to be more than just um, a building that we could hang a shingle on and say, well, we're lead platinum. We also wanted the building to be functional and need to be beautiful. Very, very challenging project for any architect and and i think that the architect that did design this building um, really a, achieved the end result but it wasn't just the architect it was a collection of construction companies construction workers um, and our workforce that came came through so the message of green buildings that i leave with you is if at first you don't succeed try try again the commitment to the goal is probably the most important thing if you can inspire your workforce to be green, it's something that's achievable. And then so when we look at the climate change challenges ahead, reduction of the carbon footprint, uh, reduction of greenhouse gases, carbonization of the of the of the buildings or reduction in carbonization of, of the building materials, um, that's all possible. Right now, I don't know how, um, but we're rolling up our sleeves and I'm very confident uh, with the quality of people that we have within the public building service. Um, we're going to get there. All right, next slide. But as we go, you know, and again, we're not going to build things just to show you that we can build them. All right, I love this quotation here that, you know, the greenest building is the one that you don't build. And keep that in mind as we go forward, you know, whenever we have a need for a project or a new new land port of entry, in fact, our, we work very closely with the North American Development Bank for people who think they have to have a new land port of entry. Um, but the first question I always ask is, can is the one that we have, can it be adapted or modified? Because in particular for re reducing greenhouse gases, that's the way to go. Renovation and modernization is always better than new construction. So let's keep that in mind too. Even though the new construction wins all the awards um, for achieving what we really wanna achieve, particularly with this administration, we're looking at renovation, not new construction. All right, next slide. Okay, and changing topics now. Now I want to talk very briefly about environmental justice. Um, this is a relatively new concept, although the people who have been working with environmental justice are taking it very seriously. Um, I wanted to introduce you to the environmental justice tool um, that's been rolled out by the um, Environmental Protection Agency um, because we found it's not enough in, in the urban areas where we're building buildings, we have to take a holistic approach and consider the needs of underserved communities. It's it's not enough to build a lead platinum building if you're displacing people whose ancestral home is on that location. Um, so we really, in the past, I would say the federal government operated in a vacuum because we didn't wanna, um, didn't want to deal with uh, complicated questions from the media and from local citizens. And so it was very insular and we weren't really a part of the community. The approach emphasizing environmental justice really emphasizes involving the whole community in projects. And we're rolling this out. I have on here, this is a picture of Brownsville. We're currently planning to modernize the uh, Brownsville Gateway land port of entry. Um, and in doing so, we've analyzed the city of Brownsville. And so click the next slide. We, we found 
we found that in the area. So the little red area on the slide, that's the footprint of the land port of entry at the, in, in Brownsville for uh, privately owned vehicles and pedestrians. And interestingly enough, that facility um, is the only thing standing between a university education for many people living in Mexico. You know, they walk across the land port of entry every day. They attend Texas Southmost College or uh, Texas a and University um, in in South Texas, and and then they they return in the evening. And so the port of entry provides a very vital role in ensuring that the economic growth of that area is facilitated. Um, but we looked at that area, and it's not enough to improve just the the bricks and mortar. Uh, we have to consider the needs, and we found that there are a number of things. Uh, there are a number of climate change-related natural hazards. Uh, there are hazardous materials that have a long legacy in the area. So as we expand and modernize the port, at the same time, we're going to have to make it a safer, um, better place to live for the residents in the area. And we're really inviting the participation in the community to do this, and we're using the EPA's um, environmental justice tool to try to help us accomplish that goal. Okay, next slide. And the last thing I want to leave you with, um, if, you, if you walk away today with nothing else, all right, write down sftool.gov, all right? And, and I just, my ask of you um, is that you check it out. Um, and I'm the sustainable facilities tool it consolidates high performance building and product information to help building professionals inside and outside the government to reduce operating costs and conserve resources there's a wealth of information it's it's the body of knowledge for green buildings that we have we're constantly updating this with information about a range of areas um, across the top you'll see a number of menus okay learn plan, explore, procure, and, and a couple others too. All right, today I wanna to talk a little bit about the learn and the procure um, tools. So if you click on learn, but uh, next slide. Okay, if you, you click on, excuse me, click on explore. Okay, and then go to the, go to the next slide. Um, you'll see like a footprint of a building and, and on the building, and then if you, there are a number of building systems. Okay, click one one more time. The building systems listed are, you know, lighting, HVAC, water, indoor environmental quality, solid waste, planted roof, submetering. There's a, a wealth of information. So just for today, as an example, if we wanted to do a deep dive into the HVAC, heating, ventilating, and, and air conditioning, you click on HVAC, okay, and then go, you get, Okay, and click on it again. There you go, you'll see a diagram and, and there are a number of features within the HVAC system that you can actually click on this and get deep information about all aspects of the heating, ventilating, and air conditioning system. Um, windows, chiller units, duct work, um, there's a deep dive, it'll go in detail about each of those features. This is a wonderful tool, not only for you, but for your children. If you want to learn, hey, here's how a building operates. Uh, you can investigate each one of these building systems and find out what's the greenest way I can go, or what's the most expensive way? What's the least expensive way? So you can do these cost and quality trade-offs and come up with the optimal approach. Um, now, obviously, building professionals who've been working with it don't need this because they already have it in the back of their head. But we're trying to get the whole community to be aware of how to be green. And the SF tool is one way that we've done it. Now, another feature on the SF tool I want to want to leave you with. Next slide. Um, for procurement, if you just click click on procurement um, and then. OK, yeah, and click click again one more time. OK. It will tell you some about the, some of the key sustainable products. So before you buy something, you know what's a what's a more efficient paint. Uh, what what materials will have a lower impact um, on greenhouse gases? You know, just to give two two examples. Um, with the time I have, I, I don't have time to kind of walk you through that, but I wanted to leave you with that thought. Okay, sftool.gov. 
spread the word. Um, this is the Bible for green building, and we're constantly updating it with information about materials and systems and what we're learning. And I think things like this of what enabled us to be successful in rolling out green buildings and will continue as we go forward because with the new emphasis on environmental justice, on climate change, on decarbonization of our buildings, I'm very confident that we're able to get there, but we can't do it alone. You know, the government is just kind of a small microcosm of the overall population. We really need to crowdsource and involve other people in addressing the most challenging issues of our future. So with that, okay, last slide. Um, this is, um, I'm, I'm trying to honor Carrie with this because it's a picture of the Ansel Duis land port of entry and very important. The way I got roped into this project, we were dealing with the North American Development Bank about an alternatively financed project uh, outside of McAllen, Texas. And, uh, and they're actually, and coincidentally, it's green, but in a different way. It's green because of all, all, all the grass and it's in a floodplain. Um, but we are planning to expand that. And I promise you when we do, um, even though uh, your tax dollars are not going to be paying for this project, um, I promise you it's going to be a very green building uh, when it's done. With that, that's all I have. Thank you, Kerry. Charlie, thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. We are going to turn our attention now to our mobility experts on the on the panel. Carlos will will speak next. He will tell us a little bit about the work of the World Resources Institute, which will lead into a discussion of the relationship between urban form and mobility and the importance of urban planning. He'll touch on some issues of mobility versus accessibility, and he'll tell us about some of his experiences in the city of Monterey, in the municipality of Monterey. Please join me in welcoming Carlos. Thank you. Uh, I'll do my best to try to the, uh, speak in English. I was planning in my mind to do it in Espanol, but uh, I'll, I'll do my best. So apologies in, in, in advance. I'm going to start talking about a little bit about WRI. Uh, maybe uh, some of you don't know about it. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, we are an international organization and we have like a methodology that is very simple the, that we try to count it, to measure it, so we can change it and then we can scale it uh, because we believe that there's a better way in the future. Uh, the way we, we tackle problems is like we try to find the ways, the, the main source of the problem what is the basic, the base of the problem, so we can then propose a solution. In order to do that, we need to measure it. Something that it cannot be measured, we cannot actually uh, solve it. So that's why in WRI, we have that in mind every time we uh, uh, enter a, a project, a, a study. We count it, we change it, so we can then later scale it. We uh, change it by providing solutions, some pilots, small pieces of solutions, and then we can scale it in another in another way. Next one, please. We in WRI focus on climate, in nature, but most of it on people. The, the, those three things that we see there, we cannot talk about. Uh, um, the Earth will live with or without us. We are not killing the Earth. Earth will for for leave us uh, after we are gone. Uh, Earth doesn't need humans. Humans need Earth. So that's why we uh, try to figure out how to save nature and climate and how can people that can adapt to climate and nature uh, uh, because we are we are we're facing really uh, great cha uh, changes that unfortunately most of them are um, are uh, a cause of our actions. Next one, please. Uh, we are in the whole world entirely. Uh, we uh, WR started four, ye four years ago. Our main office is in Washington, D.C. We have international offices in 12 countries, Brazil, Mexico, Africa, Europe, India, Indonesia, China. Uh, in Mexico, we started like uh, uh, just with one main focus about transportation. It was called CTS Embark, uh, CTS Embark, sorry. And for like 10 years, we focus on uh, giving transportation, hard transportation 
transportation solutions like BRTs, buses, etc. Now we have moved from that idea of transportation to mobility and with all the other areas that WR is working on. We are more than 1,000, uh, 12, 1,200 people working WRI, very eager to change things. Next one, please. And with that same map in mind, I uh, just I like to put those those images over there. The energy use per person and the total greenhouse gas emissions that uh, we can we can see that the the, uh, the developed world is like generating more or using more energy, but at the same time is kind of the 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 countries that are generating most more greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so we can need to change that. And in WR, we are we work in different areas. We work in climate, we work in energy, we work in cities. And next one, please. So those green gas emissions, uh, as uh, Lourdes said in the in the uh, in her first uh, um, uh, presentation, that was really really interesting. All the parts I think that we were uh, we are very aligned about that. That we need to reduce the uh, the generation of greenhouse gases fast and in this this graph uh, that was is, is integrated in the coalition for urban transportation transitions in the uh, in a article called the new urban opportunity you can see there the 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 link over there and you can uh, go there and there's a lot of information very interesting we can see that buildings the two main parts of this uh, panel here, buildings and transport, are the two main uh, areas that are um, have more impact in how the, the gases are emitted. And so we need to tackle them. Residential buildings, commercial buildings is the biggest chunk of it. But also transportation. Transportation also emits a lot of uh, greenhouse emissions in urban areas. Also, materials for building and waste, but uh, transportation and residential buildings are are the focus that we need to change. In the left part of the of the screen, you can see like these uh, zero carbon cities, kind of the same idea what Lourdes were talking was talking, that uh, those cities need to be connected, needs to be compact, and needs to be clean. Talking about compact in the United States is complicated because we know that cities in the United States are really, really sprawled out. Uh, but also in Mexico, in the northern parts of Mexico, there's a lot of cities that have more, uh, more space that they actually need, and they're becoming really, really expensive. Um, connected, we need to talk about transportation, but, but also about uh, proximity. Compact has the same thing, proximity. And clean, we need to move uh, from fuel, fossil fuels to a uh, new uh, means of uh, energy. Next one, please. So, in one of the parts of WR is focused on is in city on cities. Why cities? Because in by 50 by 2050 there will be more than 5,000 cities around the world, and uh, two thirds of the population will be living in on cities. You want, we are talking right now about a billion people living in, in, the, in this planet. And by 2050, we are we're talking about 10 billion people. So we are growing and we are, we are growing fast. There's a lot of uh, population moving into cities. And that means that most of the infrastructure of the cities hasn't been built yet. So need, we need to focus on how to build that and uh, build it in a, in a greener way. Cities concentrate jobs because there's people, but at the same time, they concentrate the emissions of greenhouse emissions. Um, there's a lot of inequity, inequity uh, growing in cities. In the so, uh, we talk about in Mexico, in the peripheral areas, the skirt. There's with the, where the people with lower income goes to live. So there's a lot of an equity access, and we'll get there. Buildings and transportation levers. So the cities are really, really important and how 
how do we are going to change cities. And um, on, uh, as a difference of, of, of Charlie, that we he was talking more about the building itself, we in WRI talk about another scale in the public public space, how, how those buildings needs to connect to each other so people can live actually in the city. Next one, please. So cities uh, seen as a system, is, is system, no systems, it's a system of systems, uh, as, as I say, that's all, cities are places where the, uh, there's an interaction of human activity, technology, and the natural environment. Uh, there's a lot of systems in themselves intricating it in the city that we can talk about transportation we can talk uh, energy water uh, food health education there's a lot of systems so it's complicated to talk about systems about cities but that's uh, that's that's very interesting there's a lot of interactions and interactions between the systems and they are vital to uh, achieve uh, inclusive and resilient carbon neutral cities next one please this graph is very interesting. It's, it's kind of old. It was made by, by Embark in, in India 10 years ago or so, but it's really, really cool to, uh, to uh, as, as an example, how a city, uh, an area of a city today has certain population, which is the first row. And then uh, we, uh, two possible futures, one that has an uh, a car oriented city, and one that might have a more sustainable mobility oriented city. The population in, in both the scenarios are the same. It grows from 5.4 to 13.2. Uh, the trips, so the, the, the number of travel that everyday people do in, in their daily lives, daily lives is still the same. Uh, well, grow from 5.6 to 39.36 in both uh, 35, in both futures. If this study was, was was made today, I think those trips were, were will be lower in the sustainable mobility. But since it was it was made uh, uh, ten years ago, they they uh, thought that they were the same kind of trips. But the the problem started in the same in the same in the next um, row with the blue one, the area. Uh, the consumption of territory, it's really important. There's the, the, there's the double of difference. So if we still create cities for cars, we even though they're autonomous, they're electric, whatever, we will have a lot of consumption of, of land. That is not good. So uh, that affects directly into the emissions. That is the next slide. But also in the uh, fatalities of traffic. So that that's an issue. Uh, last last decade was uh, the say the road safety decade, and uh, sadly there was no more change around the world. We we still have that pandemic between us. People is dying every day. A lot of millions die uh, every year by traffic uh, causes. Next slide, please. And in here, I will I will ask you please to go to forward and then go back so we can see how the the the, the city of Monterey grew in from 19 to to 20. Could you go go back and go forward? <laughs> kind of a loop. Thank you. So uh, in 1990, Monterey had 2.5 million people living there. In 2020, there's a little more than 4.5 billion million. So it's about 1.7 times. There's a huge growth. That's why we have a problem right now with water. <laughs> One of the problems uh, that uh, the governor just just talked about uh, later uh, before. But the, the urban area grow more than three times. These are conservative numbers. Actually, the numbers, I, I think they're more are higher than that. Uh, so the population grow just 1.7 times and the urban area grow three times. Next plan, please. And you can see in the, the map, the density. How could you return just one, please? Sorry. Yeah, you can see the, the, the highest on the darkest uh, uh, colors are like the density. So the density is moving away from the center from the central part of Monterey. So the infrastructure is getting older and abandoned. 
And those people that are living in the outer skirts are the low income people. So they have to pay a lot to go where the jobs are that is still in the center. Next one, please. This one is also a graph uh, that is uh, from the, that side over there that was um, uh, created by the, the Tech of Monterrey and Fundación FEMSA in, in Nuevo León that shows something very scary for me that uh, in the blue, you can see how the area of roads grew from 2000 until now. That means that local roads are really uh, expanding. Why is that? Because the suburban development subdivisions. There's a lot of local roads in the peripheral area in the outer skirts. And the arterial roads, they are pretty much the same and collectors are growing, but not as much. So there's a lot of infrastructure is being built. A lot of money is putting there in pavement. 20% of the old urbanized area in the metropolitan area is pavement. 20%. This is the largest fixed asset that the city has. And, and as any other asset, it has a life cycle. So right now it's new, but in 20 years, in 30 years, it will be needed a lot of money to support or to maintain those roads. So it has a depreciation rate. Everything every day is costing to repair it. Next one, please. And here we talk about mobility patterns. The mobility is kind of a new term. When I studied my master's, we were talking about transportation and, and I get to know what mobility is. And, and one thing that uh, it makes me clear what mobility is, is just the, uh, that has to do with the territory, the space. Every day we we uh, start a day in one place and we need to start to go to another to satisfy our needs to uh, work, education, uh, uh, etc. That need is mobility. How the city or how the environment provides the means of transportation, the modes of transportation, that's the offer. So one is the demand. Mobility is in demand. We need to move. How do we move it? Okay, the government provides the streets, provide the modes. We can buy a car, we can have a bicycle. That's our mode of transportation. That's transportation. So mobility patterns in Monterey, these are taken, these maps are generated from the uh, origin destination survey in 2019, just before the pandemic started. So we can see where the red dots are, are the where more people live and the destinations where more people go to work. That means in the center, the central part. And, and the big image on the, on the right is the sum of both. So we can see that people move everywhere. There's no like a pattern that, that uh, people from the southern parts of the city stays in the city, in the southern part of the city, they move everywhere. So there's a lot of movement in Monterrey, which creates a lot of traffic, a lot of transportation issues. Next one, please. And then it becomes, it came into action, the, uh, the concept of accessibility, not just mobility. Mobility is the need that we need to change places to satisfy our daily needs. But accessibility, how uh, can we reach jobs? How easy can we get to the school? How easy can we get to the, to the restaurant? How easy can we get to the place we need to go. And in this uh, graph um, from the uh, from a study from the WRI, it says from mobility to access of all, it shows the difference between Johannesburg and Mexico City. Mexico City, most of the people, 70, about 70% 70 of the trips in Mexico City, even though there's a lot of traffic everywhere, there's cars everywhere, 70% of people moves using public transportation. Even though you see that the, the pink line shows that just a little bit more than 50% of the people has access to uh, less than 40% of the jobs in less than 60 minutes. So the people in Mexico City has to travel more than 60 minutes every day in the morning to get to the jobs. As different as Johannesburg. No, Johannesburg, they, it's more 
uh, the, the, the transportation system uh, serves more people than those in Mexico City. So it's not just about mobility, it's not just about providing and satisfying the mobility, but it's to give them accessibility to jobs, to education. Next one, please. Uh, this methodology, we, don't, we didn't invent it, we use it. Uh, in WR, it's called avoid, shift, and improve. Actually, we, we try to call it reduce, shift, and improve. Uh, we try to avoid or reduce the uh, in the project we 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 are on. We try to avoid or reduce the the use of motor of um, motor vehicles, fuel vehicles. We 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 try to avoid those. How to well, how can we avoid that? Uh, getting the uh, smaller distances. If we want the people to walk, they will walk five, 10 minutes, no more than that. That is about 500 meters, one kilometer, less than a mile. That, that's how people will, will be willing to walk. So we need to change how closeness uh, is in the city. Shift, change the uh, private car, to uh, urban uh, urban pl uh, public transportation, railways, cycling, uh, and as also uh, uh, new mobility as a service, which is called MASS, M-S-A-S, -S. Uh, but also improve, change the way the engines are working. We 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 know that the fuel will uh, the the combustion will not last. We we are changing. We are pushing in Mexico. Uh, as different here, like uh, in Texas, we are pushing more like in public transportation to change to electric buses to provide a better service in electric buses with uh, uh, trying to do a kind of renewable energy. But well, that's a, a federal uh, uh, thing that we need to work. But with uh, with state governments, we can work on the fleets of the public transportation fleet. So we are focused on in trying to do the uh, change it to electric mobility, to electric transportation, pushing walking, pushing cycling, doing the change in changes in the infrastructure of the cities, and also created, trying to create a more robust and uh, sustainable public transportation. Next one, please. And this is pretty much the last one. Uh, this this report from Deloitte is is not actually uh, about mobility, but it's it's related to it. Mobility trends after COVID, and they put four scenarios, which are I think they are very very interesting. No? One is okay, the passing storm. Everything will go back to how it was. We now know that that wasn't is like that. Things have changed, and I, I don't think they will go back as if they were in 1919. The second scenario uh, is called they call it good company, which means that the private and the public sector uh, get together and try to solve the mobility. The third scenario is pretty much the same, but with a more emphasis on the public side and less in the private side. Uh, and the fourth scenario. It's more like just on the private side. Everyone uh, invests invests in their own cars, in their own auto uh, vehicles. They don't care about everyone else, and everything is connected and and uh, and and a very unhuman, I will say, uh, way of thinking. But which scenario will do? We don't know. We are pushing like something that public and private sectors will get together and try to solve the mobility for the people. And the last one, uh, oh no, well, just I just wanted to put here that we cannot do those changes without financing mechanisms. That's why the, I think the governor was here also, because we are in Mexico, we need a lot of financing. We, we have the ideas, but getting finance, it's really, really hard. We don't, we don't have the finance to do stuff, to try to move, to change it, to scale it. We cannot uh, go forward. And now, yeah, the last one, please. Uh, we think that this is a turning point. Uh, we we need to more build a more inclusive, resilient, and uh, low carbon uh, future. Is now or never for us, not for Earth. Earth will go be still here a million years from now. Earth doesn't need us. We need Earth. Okay. Thank you very much.
Carlos, thank you so much for your insightful comments. Last but not least, we'll be hearing from Laura Morrison. She'll tell us about her work as executive director at Techcetra Education Fund. Well, she'll talk to us about fleet electrification efforts in Texas counties and cities, planning for electric vehicle charging infrastructure, and recent federal legislation and related funding, as well as other statewide initiatives. So with that, I'll turn the mic over to Laura. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Carrie. And um, I want to say thank you to all, uh, you all for inviting me because it's been really exciting to start thinking in terms of, you know, the border and, and Mexico and the U.S. and more globally because we focus in Texas at Texetra. Um, the, pro the organization I'm with, as Carrie mentioned, is a C3 organization, so we're grant funded. We do programs and education uh, on the ground. We also have a sister organization that is a lobbying and um, advocacy organization. It's a member organization. It's made up of utilities, charging station companies, um, uh, manufacturers, consumer and environmental groups. And we do, with that organization, we do policy and pushing legislation at the state level. And obviously, I've been following what's going on at the federal level, too. Um, but absolutely, climate change, as Lourdes was mentioning, um, and, uh, and my other co-panelists, is uh, critical. And in the United States, um, transportation is actually the biggest component, uh, single component at 27%. So it's critical that we address it. The good news is that with electrifying transportation or moving to zero emission transport uh, vehicles, um, there's lots of other benefits that come along with it because there are no tailpipe emissions. So we're gonna have better air quality. With better air quality, we're gonna have better public health. Um, we're going to be able. We're going to have a lot of economic impacts that are very positive because fuel and maintenance of electric vehicles is much uh, smaller. It is an opportunity, especially if you look at all the money that's being pushed in from the feds right now. An opportunity for uh, new jobs, clean jobs. It's an opportunity for building wealth among disadvantaged communities, um, and it can also. Um, I should say, for instance, there are air quality requirements in the cities in the United States. And for instance, San Antonio and Bear County have recently, uh, will soon be moving to an air quality, uh, a worse air quality um, category, which means it's gonna be more expensive to expand some of the businesses or move some businesses in here. So it has an economic impact on your, on your community. Um, and as Charlie was mentioned, it can play a huge role in environmental justice, which is a huge uh, consideration that we have. Um, the other good news is that the transition to electric transportation is coming on fast. And if you go to the next slide, please. This is a slide of the global um, battery electric vehicle, that's BEV, and plug-in hybrid electric vehicle sales. Um, and I think the last two years there are 2020 and 2021, and you can see that the sales has doubled in the last year. So it is coming on fast. The United States and, and Mexico are not in the top 10 countries there. The top country is going to be Norway, uh, which is at, I think, something like 85% bat uh, battery electric and plug-in hybrid electric. Um, in the United States, uh, between 2021 and the first half of 2022, we doubled the percent of sales of electric vehicle from two and a half to five percent. So we were we are on the upswing. In the state of Texas, from the end of the last year to um, till August 10th, because we have a great website that counts the number of elect vehicles re electric vehicles registered in the state, it went from 100 to 140 thousand. So 40% increase in six months. So you can see we really are on the, the upswing there. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, Carlos and his comments because it really the goal and we share the goal of, um, of zero emission uh, mobility and access for services. But to the extent, and so that means, you know, building compact commu communities, it means allowing people to bike and have e-bikes, which is the, why I have this sling on right now, by the way. Um, <laughs> but uh, modern medicine is, is amazing. So accessibility to modern medicine is important. Um, 
But to the extent that there will be vehicles, because there are going to be vehicles for a long while to come, they need to be, uh, we're working to make sure that they are uh, uh, zero um, emissions. So the good news is that the um, Biden administration has set a goal of 50% uh, sales uh, electric vehicle by 2030, which is an, which is an aggressive goal. Um, and there are a lot of um, barriers, or you could say challenges that we need to overcome um, that, it, but there's a lot of legislation that's been passed just in the past few months uh, to help us through there. There's the December, uh, last December, it was the, um, I need to get this right, it's the IIJA, it's the Investment in Infrastructure and Jobs Act. There's the IRA, the Inf uh, Inflation Reduction Act that was this month, and then also the Chips and Science Act that was passed this month. And all of that is pouring money into um, helping to address climate change and some of, some of that is um, all about electric transportation. So some of the um, challenges that we have are making sure that the electricity that we use to fuel these uh, is renewable. We need to make sure that the um, batteries are reused and recycled so that they have the least amount of impact on um, on the environment, and both of those were addressed uh, in in those uh, that legislation that I mentioned. Um, we need to make sure we have an accessible supply of electric vehicles, and um, that means hopefully the prices will be coming down. We're going to be getting more models, that's for sure. Um, and if I think the next slide shows that um, the manufacturers are certainly on board with uh, moving toward electric. You might have heard, I think the first one out of the gate was uh, General Motors. Um, that was last year when they announced that their goal was by 2035, they would not be producing any more gasoline powered vehicles. That's a big, big change. And since then, uh, this shows all the other commitments that the other manufacturers have been making. Um, let's see, and then of course, building the charging infrastructure for the electric vehicles. Um, and with charging, we need to think about it in a few different categories. Um, if you're going on a long trip, you wanna be able to stop along the road and refuel your car quickly. And that will require um, a fast charger, DC fast charger. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, if you happen to have a garage and you pull in your garage at night, you can plug it into the wall and good chance you'll be able to get enough electricity out of the wall um, by the next morning when you go to work again. And then there's something in between and that is uh, called a level two charger and that would need a 240 um, plug and it's a little more expensive and it would be a lot faster than the wall, but not as fast as the fast chargers themselves. Um, so the good news here is that um, there are a lot of improvements coming and a lot of investments in charging uh, that the feds have passed recently. So if you go to the next slide, I think it is. Um, the IIJA created something called the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program, otherwise known as NEBI. Um, and it's a formula program $5 billion is coming to put uh, charging stations, make sure that all of our freeways are gonna be covered every 50 miles with a fast charger, which is going to allow us to do long distance travel. And out of that $5 billion, Texas is getting 408 million of that. that. And all, each of the states have to put together their own plan for how they would use that. And so Texas actually put together a really terrific plan. Everybody's quite happy with it to some degree, um, and uh, half of the money, for the first thing is we're gonna cover all the freeways with fast chargers. And interestingly, to make sure that all of our freeways in the state are covered every 50 miles, we only need 55 more fast chargers. So we've got quite a few already. Um, secondly, we wanna make sure that the rural areas are covered. So that's where you see that line 190 rural high-speed chargers. There's gonna be one, make sure that there's one in every county. Uh, every, uh, we have 254 counties, 190 of them don't even have any fast chargers. So it'll take care of that. 
And then the second half of the funding will go to the urban areas. And with regard to the urban areas, um, that's gonna be allocated to what's called the Metropolitan Planning Organizations, because each urban area has one of those. And then they, and it'll be based, it'll be allocated based on population, how many miles are driven, air quality, if the air quality is poor. So, so Bear County is gonna get a, a bump up in the amount of money because the air, air quality is poor. Um, and then it's gonna be up to those communities to figure out how it is that money should be spent. And this is where, for instance, the environmental justice stuff that Charlie was talking about is so important because the um, one of the requirements with this money is that it satisfy what is called the Justice 40 initiative, which says that 40% of all the benefits of the investment must come to disadvantaged and underserved communities. So the idea is we need to go into each of those communities and say, what are your priorities? Where should they go? What is the most important thing to do with this money for charging? Um, and make sure that 40% of the benefits then address the community. Um, and if you can go to the next slide, I think I have a list there, but that's how much, how much money is going to each of the MPOs. And it's a little hard to see, but um, it's actually a quite a bit of money. El Paso is gonna be getting seven and a half million. Um, the Rio Grande Valley will be getting eight million and Laredo will be getting uh, like one and a half million. So um, that is a big investment in charging station in, these com in each of these communities. Um, so next slide. Um, I love this picture. I stole it from somebody else that had already done it. The point being that transition and modes of, of transportation can happen really fast. And the, that first slide I showed where it's showing how we're doubling these sales in a year is one way to look at it. But this it looks back in history. The one on the left is Easter morning, 1900, Fifth Avenue, New York City. And if you look carefully, I don't know if you can see it, but there's one little red circle there. That's the one car on the street. Everything else is horse and buggy. On the right, 13 years later, same spot. There's not a, there's not a horse on the street. So it was a 13 year transition in New York City from horse-drawn carriages to um, cars. And fact of the matter is it could happen just as fast. And if the federal government has anything to do with it, it will. Um, and then I just want to talk briefly, I've been talking more about individual cars, but electrifying fleets is also really critical because they have a lot to do with the um, greenhouse gas emissions and air quality problems that we have. And there is um, a lot of work going on there and a lot of movement already. You might have heard that Amazon has already committed to 100,000 delivery vehicles that are electric by 2030. In our own work, we've been working with different counties around the state, and this is really interesting to me. Um, first, we approached Dallas, uh, excuse me, Travis County, which is Austin, where I live, and they've always been sort of forward leaning on environmental work. And so they said, yeah, we'd be happy to electrify our fleet and they're building a plan and they're starting to do that. We also did that with Bear County and Bear County has now committed to it. And just recently, we started working with Dallas and um, Tarrant County, which is Fort Worth. And those are not counties that you think about as like being out there on the forefront of environmental initiatives, but they also are very interested in our, and Dallas has already committed to it, and the commissioners in uh, Tarrant County are gonna be considering a resolution at the end of the month. And the bottom line is it's getting beyond politics now because it's, um, it's a good business business decision to start doing this. So that's very exciting. And um, also there's a lot of money that's been poured into school buses. And I wanna acknowledge um, WRI in the United States, they've done a lot of work on electrifying school buses and um, there's gonna be a lot of transition there. Uh, Fort Worth ISD and Dallas ISD are both working on that. And then lastly, I just wanna mention a couple of things uh, in closing about um, opportunities along the border, not only um, is there the 
money coming for charging company, charging stations along the border. Um, but there's also um, a lot of money in both of those, uh, in both the IRA and the IIJA for port electrification. I think in the IIJA, there's up to, as I counted it, up to $9 billion that will be invested in port electrification. And then the IRA explicitly has uh, $3 billion more, plus a billion dollars for heavy duty. Um, and so those are two impacts that we'll be, um, we'll be seeing on the border. And then the next one I want to, the last one I want to mention is that the, um, the, there are incentives in the IRA for buying electric vehicles, uh, $7,500 incentive. So that's going to save people a lot of money. It's going to drive a lot of, of, um, of uh, certain models. But to be eligible for that incentive, two things. One, the final assembly has to be done in North America, not just in America, but in North America. And also there are requirements on the battery and the, and the minerals that have can be uh, that has to be done in North America. So I think you're definitely going to be seeing that there'll be uh, that will drive investment decisions about where things are going to be made. And I would imagine that that Mexico will definitely be part of that. So lot to say. Um, I'm going to just stop there. Thank you. Laura, thank you so much for your comments. I see Jesse coming to the podium. I think we're going to have to continue our discussion offline. I invite you to please talk to our panelists in the moments and the minutes that we have between now and the end of the day. And I know I have lots of questions for each of them. And thank you all so much for being here. And we look forward to continuing the conversation.